Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure today to be able to introduce Dr. Serge Eggelman. Um, Serge's research focuses on privacy and usable security. Uh, Serge earned his PhD from CMU and was in the field which he helped create, uh, which is now known as social computing. Uh, and after that, he was a postdoc at Brown University. Uh, Serge is currently director of the Usable Security and Privacy Group at ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute. And Serge also co-directs the Berkeley Lab for Usable and Experimental Security. Um, even though Serge is uh, relatively um, young, he has accomplished a lot. He's published 14 papers at the premier uh, HCI conference, which is known as CHI, and six of those papers have won awards. Serge also is no stranger to the School of Information. He actively collaborates with a number of faculty and students in the school. And in fact, in uh, 2012, his paper with our students Lizzie Haw and Ariel Haney won the Distinguished Paper Award at the leading conference on usable security, uh, SOUPS. Today, Serge is going to talk about a user-centered approach to improving privacy on mobile platforms. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Serge Eggelman. Uh, thanks a lot for that uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, I'm here quite often, but uh, rarely get to uh, speak in front of everyone. So uh, this is a great honor. Um, anyway, I was planning to talk today on uh, previous and ongoing work that um, uh, my group and I have been doing on how to empower users to make better decisions in mobile environments, um, as well as you know, forward thinking on how to uh, build on that to help people make better decisions in IoT environments uh, in the future, as well as uh, other types of ubiquitous sensing environments. So broadly speaking, uh, I'm primarily interested in looking at why people make poor privacy and security decisions, uh, and then you know, through uh, studies using um, you know, HCI methods, uh, gathering empirical data on human decisions and behavior, using that data to help create data-driven improvements uh, for interfaces and systems. And so, you know, a hint, all of this has to do with usability, a, a lot of it in terms of poor privacy and security decision making, as I'm going to go into in this talk. Uh, but before I get into the, the work on uh, mobile environments, uh, which is the main part of the talk, I was going to talk about a little bit of background work so you get an idea of some of the breadth of my interests. So uh, way back when, uh, one of my first interests was looking at browser security warnings. I did a lot of this in grad school and have still been doing a lot of work on browser security warnings on the side. So this is a uh, warning from Firefox circa <coughs> around 2000, I believe. And you know, there is a very clear affordance here. So most users will see this, and their eyes will jump to the OK button or the Cancel button, um, and you know, dismissing it uh, because this is something that's gotten in the way. So you know, for most users, it really looks like this. Something bad happened, and you need to click OK to continue doing whatever it is what you were doing. You know, there's a bunch of jargon in the center, um, which isn't really going to help the user make a better decision. They can click another button to read even more jargon, which still really isn't going to help them make a better decision. Or they can click the big OK button, which they know once they push that, they no longer have to think about security. And so this, you know, th these problems are pervasive, and these are, you know, fundamentally HCI problems. So uh, a lot of the work that I did in the past was looking at uh, applying models from uh, ergonomics to better understand how these types of warnings fail. Uh, one of the, the common themes is uh, habituation. So people often see these warnings in very benign situations, uh, to the point that once they see a very similar looking warning in a more serious situation, they confuse it with the benign situations and you know, learn to dismiss them. Uh, the use of jargon, um, which I just mentioned. Another problem is the lack of clear recommendation. So, you know, if your eyes just jump to the affordances, the OK and the cancel button, uh, and you don't read the jargon, which you're probably not going to understand otherwise, there's not a clear recommendation of what it is that you should do. 
So I did a series of studies on these uh, to analyze the, you know, the depth of the, these problems. Uh, I made several rec recommendations, uh, and then during uh, about a six-month period, which I spent at Microsoft Research, uh, I helped the IE team apply a lot of the findings. So this is a warning from, I believe this was IE6, um, which is a, the phishing warning that we experimented with in the lab. And the problem with this is it appears actually identical to uh, the, the SSL warning at the time. So it has the same background, it had you know, similar text, uh, with similar jargon, you know, phishing was you know, substituted for you know, TLS error. Um, but it doesn't really you know, help most users and they were habituated. So after consulting with the IE team, uh, they redesigned the warning based on my recommendations and actually a lot of the other browsers have now followed suit for using different uh, style warnings for more serious security errors. Uh, another uh, uh, previous project that I worked on, um, this was also worked on while uh, visiting MSR, was looking at backup authentication. So currently, most uh, websites that you interact with, if you forget your password, you have secret questions. Um, so these are things that ostensibly uh, only you remember about you know, your interests or your you know, biography um, that would be hard for others to guess. So we conducted a large-scale experiment where we had people come into the lab with uh, friends and relatives, and we had them try and guess each other's secret questions. And by and large, what we found was that you know the ones that were easy to remember were also very easy to guess by either you know acquaintances um, or relatives, but also random strangers because a lot of the questions suffered from low entropy. So things like you know what was the model or make of your first your first car? Well, if you look at you know the most popular you know cars on the market, you could probably guess most people's answers within you know five attempts or so and get into their account. Um, so we made a, a, you know, a, a new system based on uh, what we called social authentication, where uh, you would assign trustees ahead of time at account enrollment, and if you ever forget your password, you would then have to contact these trustees out of band who would get unique codes, which you'd have to recover, enter into a website to you know, then create a new password. Uh, this system was actually adopted by Facebook. Uh, they call it Trusted Contacts, and it's still in use today. Uh, Microsoft also adopted this on the Windows Live login page, but I don't know if that's still exists. I don't know if Windows Live login exists at all. Um, anyway, so here you can see this. You know, so if you forget your password, it shows you who your trustees are. It, you know, it tells you, tell them to visit this URL. It'll give them each a unique code. You have to then collect those codes. You enter them here, and then you reset the password. Um, and then the last uh, prior project I wanted to talk about that had some impact, um, this was work that was actually done uh, over the past uh, two years here at Berkeley, uh, looking at Tor Browser. For those who aren't familiar, uh, it's a privacy-enhancing technology. It allows people to anonymously you know, browse the web through a series of proxy servers. It's actually um, starting to be used a lot as a censor censorship circumvention device, um, so various oppressive regimes that filter the internet, you can use Tor Browser. The problem is there are a lot of very complicated configuration options if you're gonna use it for this purpose. So you have to you know, understand transport protocols, um, enter you know, addresses of proxy servers, and so forth. So uh, we first sat down, um, we decided to do some you know, iterative uh, user-centered design to try and redesign this, uh, the interface, the first thing we did was a couple of cognitive walkthroughs where we looked uh, through the settings interface um, and applied some heuristics. We then performed some qualitative experiments where we simulated censorship, censorship environments using uh, firewall rules and we had people do tasks and configure Tor Browser to do so. We looked at what the errors they made were. Uh, and then we made some uh, you know, new designs. Uh, this actually involved uh, Ganesh, who's a MIM student. I don't see him here. Um, Nathan, uh, who's a PhD student who I'm co-advising, was also a part of this project. Um, and we made some changes. Uh, we implemented them, and we did a lab study to validate um, our findings. And now Tor is uh, using our suggestions, and the, the lead student is now uh, employed by the Tor project as the UX lead. So um, without further ado, uh, our feature presentation on uh, mobile privacy. Um, but before you know, I, I get to that. You know, so where do mo where do privacy notices come from? So this is a bigger issue. Uh, this is an open question. Yeah, that yes, um, that is in fact correct. <laughs> uh, so. This isn't just U.S. based, but you know, in the U.S., the governing privacy framework is this notion of notice and choice. Um, this comes from the Fair Information Practice Principles, the FIPS, um, which is uh, 
policy guideline that the FTC has developed. Um, Commerce, I think, has a similar uh, policy framework. Um, this is also very much related to the OECD privacy guidelines, which also lists notice. And what I mean by notice is stating privacy practices in some you know, sort of document, um, though it's not necessarily clear that you know, the, the text-based policy um, has to be the way that notice comes across. It's just one tool of many that you know, seems to be the most popular. And there's enforcement mechanisms around this. So the FTC uh, interprets uh, Section 5, which is you know, deceptive practices of the FTC Act, to mean that you know, companies that give notice about privacies, that privacy policies, and then deviate from those policies, that constitutes you know, a sanctionable violation. So that, you know, there is enforcement, there also is sector by sector uh, enforcement, which I'm gonna get into later. So how does this work in practice? So you know, there's a lot of work on privacy preferences. Many people you know, express strong privacy preferences. Say you're one of them, you're gonna buy a product online, say batteries, we're gonna shop for some batteries. Um, you have strong privacy preferences, you search for batteries in your search engine, which of these websites are you gonna go to? Are you gonna go to the first one? Maybe the fourth one? How are you gonna decide this? So you know, under this current you know, mechanism of notice and choice via the privacy policy document, the only way of, you know, accomplishing this task right now would be visit each of these websites, read their privacy policy text, which, as Marty pointed out, is written by lawyers and might not actually uh, help you understand what the policy actually is or what that says about your, you know, they're gonna do to your sensitive data. Um, and, you know, in the process of doing all that, you've now released clickstream data to all of these websites. So one project I did a while back was looking at how we can improve you know, uh, the user experience. So here we have you know, annotations that represent the privacy policy. So uh, when I built this, it was called Privacy Finder. Uh, I was mining P3P policies, which was a W3C standard for uh, machine readable privacy policies. We could then annotate websites in the search engine without having to release clickstream information from the user. And so now people can make an informed decision about which site they go to. And so now there's a trade-off. So now we can actually, we have metrics. So uh, we can have people put their money where their mouth is. And so I designed studies around this where uh, people, you know, the, the sites were priced uh, in, you know, uh, correlation with the, you know, the quality of the privacy policy. So people who, you know, uh, espouse strong, you know, privacy preferences, uh, they can actually pay more money to go to such a website. And sure enough, what we found is with increased usability, people will actually pay more money uh, to get better privacy. Um, there was a strong effect with privacy sensitive items. Um, we had people buying all sorts of privacy sensitive items in the lab, um, which uh, I can go into later if you want. Um, less of effect with you know, less privacy sensitive items, but still an effect in many cases. So here, better usability does lead to better privacy. So generally speaking, you know, how do we evaluate notices? How should we be evaluating notices? So one of the things that I've drawn a lot from is uh, a model in the ergonomics literature. So this is called the Communication Human Information Processing Model. And basically, it's a nice framework for looking at how notices fail users, because it breaks down the, the processing of a notice into several different steps, which could all be measured separately in various laboratory environments. So, um, you know, the, the receiver characteristics, that's the human. Um, I mean, there's, there are elements at the top about, you know, contents of the notice, but, you know, really what we're interested in is from attention switch on down. So that is, you know, does the user actually notice the notice? So attention switch, is it, you know, designed in such a way that they see it, they switch their attention to it, and then attention and maintenance, do they notice it long enough to attempt to actually parse it? So, you know, comprehension and memory, do they understand it? Maybe, uh, you know, for the memory aspect of it, they're, you know, habituated, so they think they remember what it says and therefore don't uh, try and comprehend it after subsequent uh, viewings. Attitudes and beliefs, so you might actually see a notice, understand what it says, but, you know, due to various attitudes um, or beliefs about it, maybe you don't trust it. Uh, maybe that's where the warning fails. Uh, then there's motivation. So, you know, here you might believe everything that the notice says, but you might simply be unmotivated. So in one study that I did uh, looking at uh, browser security warnings, uh, we were looking at phishing warnings in the laboratory. We had participants come in, and uh, the participants who ignored the warning and entered their credentials into the web page, uh, we asked them afterwards, you know, why you did that, uh, what did the warning tell you? 
And what they said was, well, you know, I was using your computer and therefore I didn't care about malware, which is, you know, a very <laughs> rational response, right? Um, I mean, uh, but that's, you know, bounded rationality. So, you know, that's rational if that was in fact the threat model. Um, and so that illustrates the point that the, you know, those notices were failing at motivation because they weren't adequately communicating the, the specific threat to people. And then finally, there's the behavior stage. Um, and there's a lot of HCI literature about this. So um, Don Norman has written a lot about the gulf of execution, the gulf of, of evaluation. So the gulf of execution, people might be completely motivated to do the right thing, but the, you know, the UI might be so convoluted that they can't figure out how to do it. And so it could be failing there. Uh, the gulf of uh, evaluation, they might actually do the right thing, but there aren't feedback mechanisms in place for them to understand that they did the right thing and can move on, and so therefore they might do something else completely undermining you know, the correct thing that they did but didn't realize that they did. So this is a good framework for thinking about how to do notices properly. In particular, you know, more visual notices, not necessarily you know, textual privacy policies, but you probably could apply this to you know, uh, privacy policy text too. So how does this apply to smartphones? Well, smartphones are interesting because you know, almost everyone has one now. Smartphones, for a lot of people, have filled a, you know, kind of a, a use case that uh, desktops and laptops you know, were sort of you know, overfilling. So many people uh, just need to browse the web or communicate and you know, don't really need a desktop uh, or you know, a laptop. And so almost everyone now has a smartphone. And they're you know, advantageous because you can do a lot of you know, things on them. Uh, and most of the modern platforms now allow for third-party apps, which uh, creates you know, rich user experiences, but all of the sensor data and you know, PII stored on the device uh, also creates privacy risks. So by and large, now all of the smartphone platforms um, have privacy notices to communicate to the user what data uh, an app might request from them. So in this case, here's uh, one version of the Android OS uh, where the notices were displayed at install time. So when the user installs an app, after selecting an app from a store, from the, from the app store, they get a list of the abilities that that app is requesting. And so what I'm planning to talk about today is looking at you know, these types of notices and how to improve the, the user experience around these notices. So some of the questions that my group has been looking at is you know, when to show these and how that affects privacy decision making, um, which gets to you know, under what circumstances. You know, maybe we shouldn't be showing these every single time a user uses an application, which isn't certainly far from the case. Um, and there are certainly cases where these should be shown when they're not. Um, and then how we can you know, apply uh, the theory of contextual integrity uh, to these notices to further improve the user experience. Um, and we're doing a little bit of that through machine learning, as I'm going to detail. Um, the problem is, if we're going to be applying machine learning to make privacy decisions on behalf of the user, we're not going to get perfect accuracy. So the user needs to go somewhere to get feedback about what, the de you know, what decisions the system has made on their behalf so they can correct those decisions. And then finally, why is this all important? which I'm going to talk about at the end. So, you know, first question is when to show notices. So I showed that previous screenshot from Android. Um, that's showed at install time um, under that, that particular notice. Here was an earlier version. So for the first, I think, three major versions of Android, they used this uh, orange color scheme, which is probably pretty hard for everyone to read. Uh, but it had this, it's the same information as the previous one, which uh, changed color schemes uh, at some point. Anyway, the user sees these at installation and then never sees this again. So we decided to perform a uh, uh, study in two parts to look at whether people notice these and understand them and whether they actually use them for decision making. Um, and this, actu this study actually involved two MIMS students. Um, anyway, so the first part of the study we did online. We showed people screenshots of these uh, permission prompts, uh, privacy notices, and we simply asked them, you know, what does this enable the app to do? These were existing Android users. Uh, we recruited them through AdMob, which was Google's mobile advertising platform, so that way we can be assured that everyone viewing our survey was an existing Android user because they were completing it on their Android phone. And then we performed a laboratory study afterwards uh, with 24 people, existing Android users, and did a think aloud experiment and some structured interviews to gather qualitative data. So here's an example of one of the questions. Uh, we gave each participant three different one of these permission prompts drawn at random, and we asked them, you know, given this, what would this enable the application to do? So this says internet access in uh, the fine print, which is hard to read, under network communication. 
So this would enable you know, loading advertisements and sending information to an application server. <coughs> As I said, every participant got three of these, uh, and what we found was that comprehension was very low. There were only eight participants out of 308 who answered all three questions correctly. A majority of people couldn't get any of these correct. So you might you know, rush to say, well, this is an online experiment. It was unsupervised. Maybe they were just randomly clicking buttons. Well, it was multiple choice, so we can calculate the expected value of randomly clicking buttons. And we find that you know, the, the average of 0.6 out of 3 is actually uh, statistically significant uh, you know, when compared to the expected value. And so that suggests you know, some people at least were you know, trying to give it a good faith effort, but despite that, most people could not understand these interfaces. Uh, and that's why we did the qualitative study, to try and figure out why. And we had a couple of main findings from this. So the first was that people were simply habituated. So they say, you know, I see these every time I install an application, I know to click through it. So this suggests there are too many requests, uh, and therefore maybe the information should only be shown when necessary. So you know, think about the last one, full internet access. We've measured that about, you know, at the time, 90% of apps request internet access. So from a purely information theoretic standpoint, maybe we should only warn people when an application isn't requesting internet access, because that would actually impart more information upon them. Uh, the second finding is that many people were simply unaware. They said, you know, and, and then we observed this in the lab. We gave them tasks where uh, they had to think aloud and install apps from the App Store. Many people simply clicked right over the screen. They said, oh, this is the license agreement that I know that I need to click through in order to install the app. So, you know, maybe this is happening too late in the process. There are also various cognitive biases at play. So maybe choice supportive bias. They've gone through the effort to choose an app from the App Store. They probably don't want to revisit that decision. So maybe the information should be provided at the time they're actually doing the decision making. So we published this study. Um, the first author is now working at Google and was working on the Android team. Um, and about a year or so later, both uh, Google and Apple made changes. So now this is the, the current notice regime on mobile platforms. We see these uh, ask on first use prompts. So the first time an application requests access to one of only a small handful now of sensitive resources, the user receives a prompt um, at runtime. So that's kind of useful. They're actually doing something on the device when they see this. They weren't you know, going through the process of installing the app. But you know, there are problems with this. So you know, wh what's the first problem that anyone sees with this? They ask on first use. That's a good question. Um, that's not what I was uh, going to get at, but uh, that is also a very good question. Um, this ignores context. So you know, this only asks the first time the data is requested by the app. It might be you know, under perfectly you know, understandable reasons. So maybe I'm using an app to find things near me. I click the button to find things near me. I get the prompt saying it wants location. That seems like an appropriate use for location data. I grant it. But now I've also enabled the app to, you know, in perpetuity, grant you know, access location data for behavioral advertising, maybe even when I'm not even using the app. And you know, unless the user goes into you know, several layers of settings menus to figure out what the app is doing and when, they're not going to understand when this is happening. And in practice, most users are never going to revisit that decision. So you know, maybe we should show privacy notices more than once. But you know, obviously, we probably don't want to do that every time. So the question is, under what circumstances should we show the privacy notices? We shouldn't show them install time. You know, we should show them more than just the first time the app requests the data. So in answering this question, we wanted to look at how often the apps are accessing sensitive data in practice. And to do this, uh, since Android is open source, uh, I'm picking on Android throughout this talk um, only because it's open source, which is great and allows us to make modifications to the OS to run experiments, uh, iOS has you know, probably similar problems. So we modified the Android OS so that we could uh, instrument the API methods that, that are involved in accessing sensitive user data or sensor data on the device. That way, every time an application accesses some of this data, we can log it and then ask about it or do other things with it in the future. 
as well as look at what else is you know, happening on the device when the sensitive data is accessed. So there's the context, right? So in terms of contextual data, every time one of these APIs was called, uh, we logged the timestamp, visibility, and what I mean by visibility is, uh, was the application in the foreground or not when it was requesting sensitive user data? Um, or if it was running in the background, were there other cues that the application was running? So maybe you know, a music player was playing music and running in the background, the user has some contextual cue that you know, that application is running. Screen status, so were they even using the phone? Was the screen off uh, when, the act, you know, when, the, when the data was requested? Connectivity, location, uh, view, what I mean by that is what UI elements were exposed to the user. So maybe you know, if, if a resource request is, you know, always occurs after pressing a particular button, well, it could be inferred that that button has something to do with you know, the user being in the loop and is aware that the data is requested because they pushed that button, as well as you know, what else they were doing at the, on the device at the time. So what we wanted to do initially was experience sampling. We wanted to give people phones with our instrumentation on it and then have you know, prompts that would come up to, ask you know, to tell people data was requested, are you okay with this, so we can measure expectations. The problem is, uh, for a one-week study, I was a little concerned that this would you know, have a priming effect. So if you know, the very first thing that they do in the study, they get this privacy prompt, uh, they might you know, start changing their behavior during the rest of the week of the study. For maybe a longer study, that priming effect is probably gonna go away over time. So instead, what we did, uh, you know, we refer to as retrospective experience sampling. Instead of prompting them in the moment, we took a screenshot. So that we, you know, they then came back to the lab, we showed them a couple of the screenshots and said, you were doing this thing on your phone, uh, data was requested, you know, explain what you're doing and whether, you know, what your reactions are to this. We only took these um, surrounding a small subset of the different uh, sensitive data requests, and this was based on previous work, which I'm not going to go into. So they came back to the lab. Uh, we had a little utility so they could do this in private in case there were sensitive screenshots. They plugged the phone into the computer um, on their own. It then shows them a screenshot. It says when the photo was taken, this particular app was scanning for Wi-Fi. You know, how expected is this on a scale of one to five? And you know, if given the choice, would you have allowed this? So they did this a few times um, for you know, their one week of usage, and we collected a pretty rich data set that looked like this. So here's a screenshot of a solitaire app. Um, what was happening was you know, the Wi-Fi state, which contains the SSID, which could be used for location tracking. Um, but it was actually Spotify that was making the request and not the solitaire app, which is why visibility is set to false. So that indicates that Spotify wasn't even playing music when this occurred, it was just running in the background. Um, you know, it shows where they were. This, you know, Solitaire was the current view, the main screen of Solitaire, and shows the other apps that they had previously opened. So from our, you know, 40 phones that we gave people over the course of a week, 36 made it back to our lab. Um, and this amounted to a little over 6,000 hours of real world usage. Um, and this corresponded to 27 million uh, attempts to access sensitive data during that one week of, you know, real usage. So we had some interesting findings here in terms of looking at you know, what sort of data requests were expected versus unexpected by uh, the users. So the first thing that was really interesting is that the, the vast majority of the time that sensitive data was requested by third-party apps, the user had no idea because it was happening completely invisibly to them. So you know, a large portion of the time, 60%, it was because the screen was off, which is to be expected, right? I mean, we've done some measurement studies. You know, we know that the screen is off probably the most of the time on your device, but most people are unlikely to think that apps are running in the background and requesting access to their personal data during that time as well. Another thing is um, even the indicators that are supposed to uh, impart some of this privacy information don't really work according to user expectations. So on both Android and iOS, there's a location icon, and ostensibly this is supposed to appear whenever the GPS hardware is queried. But uh, the vast majority of the time when applications request access to location data, they're not doing it by querying the GPS hardware directly. So what we found is 99.96% of the time, applications are collecting location data uh, via you know, other means, such as looking at the SSIDs, or could be collecting location data through looking at SSIDs of nearby Wi-Fi hotspots, by looking at the cellular connection data, um, and so forth. And there have been previous studies that show that this coarse-grained location data is actually almost as accurate 
accurate as the GBS data. It's not clear whether applications are doing this intentionally to avoid you know, signaling to the user that uh, you know, location data is being collected. But the problem with this is you know, people know that when the, uh, the icon appears, location data is being collected. And therefore, they're probably likely to assume that, that you know, the corollary to that is you know, the, when the location you know, icon is not there, applications are not collecting location data, um, which we know to be false. So is the quest, you know, is the answer to all of this more runtime requests to, you know, to promote more awareness? Well, you know, looking at the amount of data that we've collected, uh, the answer is obviously not because, you know, if we did this every single time one of these requests, you know, happens, that would be over 200 times per hour, which, you know, basically then, you know, you would just be using your phone to swat away these uh, privacy notices. Uh, but at the same time, you know, people want something done. So 80% of our participants wanted to block at least one of these uh, requests, and on average, they wanted a third of them blocked. So, you know, lessons learned. We found that the visibility of the application was a very strong contextual cue. So uh, when people said that they expected the application to be requesting that data, that was very significantly correlated with whether the application was running and they were using, or whether they were actually using that application. Uh, you know, as, as I just pointed out, the frequency that these occur make it impractical to do this every single time. So, you know, maybe we can extend this ask on first use to sor sort of account for context. And so that brings us to this next theory. So privacy is contextual integrity. Um, this is something that the philosopher Helen Nissenbaum has done a lot of work on. And so the idea here is, you know, instead of just giving notice every time to people, which we know is kind of an unworkable situation, we should just be looking at what's un un inappropriate or uh, unexpected. And she models this as uh, contextual information norms. So we can model this by looking at, you know, the data subject, so who's the data on, you know, where's the data going, uh, who's, you know, who's sending the data what the data is, what's the information type, and then transmission principles, so constraints, so maybe uh, whether the data is encrypted, whether it, can, you know, it should not be you know, reshared, and so forth. And you know, what we mean when we talk about context is just you know, the setting where this information flow is taking place. So maybe we should you know, be reasoning about you know, the context here, so the setting surrounding the data, what it's being used for, and maybe that's how we should decide to you know, show people privacy notices. So what does this actually mean for user-centered design? Well, you know, showing notices in context. So maybe we should only, you know, provide notice to people uh, when there's, you know, reason to believe that, you know, a data flow is likely to be unexpected or inappropriate. Um, if we want to prevent habitu habituation, then we shouldn't give people notices uh, when a flow is likely to be appropriate or something that the user expects. So there's no reason if I open up Google Maps, it should then ask me permission to, you know, to use GPS because that's probably an expected, you know, use of the data. So, how can we design notices to better account for this context? So, you know, simply applying, uh, you know, her model is likely impossible because there, you know, there's a lot of, you know, things going on in the system that are probably impossible, to, you know, to definitively determine. But maybe we can do the next best thing. Maybe we're really only care, you know, only caring about shifts between expected uses versus unexpected ones. So, you know, in the case of the previous study, uh, maybe all that we care about is prompting when applications are, you know, requesting data invisibly. Those are the cases where it's unexpected. So what we wanted to do then is build a classifier. Um, and so what we did was we did a field study with uh, over 130 Android users. Again, building on our previous instrumentation uh, within Android, we pushed, uh, you know, we, re we flashed people's devices with our you know, OS level instrumentation. Excuse me. And over the course of a month, um, since we did this for a month, it was infeasible to have 130 people come into the lab and look over screenshots taken over the course of that month. Uh, we decided to use experience sampling. So uh, we tuned uh, the algorithm to, at most, prompt people with one of these notices uh, once per day. And we did this uh, to optimize for a breadth of permission types and at requesting applications. So here it says, you know, a particular application has accessed, you know, a particular data type. Given the choice, would you have allowed or denied this? And we used this as our training set. Uh, and then we tried uh, training a classifier. The other features that we looked at uh, fell into sort of three categories. So there was behavioral data. The idea here is that we wanted to look at other privacy protective behaviors going on in the device to see if we could, you know, 
predict their privacy preferences. So when I talk about privacy protective behaviors, I mean the amount of time they spend looking at you know, privacy settings on the device, whether they have other security software installed, such as you know, two-factor authentication, uh, or maybe even you know, anti-privacy behaviors, such as using speakerphone frequently. Uh, we measured, you know, we had a whole feature set that we looked at. We collected permission information. So, you know, again, before we had all these APIs instrumented so we could look at, you know, every single time data was accessed, what type of data, what application was accessing that data, and then the same contextual data as before. So what else was going on on the device? So from our 131 users, um, this corresponded to 176 million events during the course of a month and 4, 000, over 4,000 prompts. Again, this was the, you know, dependent variable. And because of this data and you know, the previous system, which is ask on first use, it's what you know, everyone probably has on their de device right now, that's deterministic. So we can, you know, looking at the first prompt the user got during our experiment, we can then measure the accuracy of the current system, ask on first use, because, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, uh, how we decided which events to prompt on. So we, wanted, we didn't want to habituate them, so we set it so at most we, it would prompt them once per day, and we optimized it, we, so we did reservoir sampling, so we had you know, buckets for uh, permission types and requesting application, because we wanted to get a good breadth of different uh, applications and different permission types so that we can you know, best train our model. Uh, so, you know, we can look at the first, you know, the first time a user is prompted for a particular application permission type combination, and we know under the ask on first use system, whatever they say to that prompt uh, would occur, you know, in the future every time that same combination occurred. Uh, since we were doing this reservoir sampling, though, people would be prompted again during our study so we can see whether their subsequent decisions uh, were the same as their first decision, which we could then use to measure the accuracy of the ask on first use system. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. So doing that, uh, what we found is, you know, during the course of a month, uh, on average, there were about 12 unique uh, application permission type combinations per, you know, per person, which would have resulted in about 12 prompts over the course of a month. And that resulted in an error rate of 15%. So that's not bad. Using uh, just machine learning, you know, when we train our classifier using the experience sampling data, so we can tune the number of you know, data points per participant we're training on. So say we train on zero prompts and just focus on the behavioral data that we collected, so how often they were looking at security settings and things like that. Uh, we can actually do a not terrible job of predicting you know, what they would have said to the prompts had we prompted them. So we get an error rate of about 25% by not showing them anything. So that's, that's actually, um, as we detail in this paper, um, that it's a lot better than the install on first use system, but you know, obviously not as good as the ask on first use. So again, tuning the number of you know, prompts that we train on, if we train on 12 prompts per person uh, over the course of a month, uh, that's comparable to the ask on first use system. And we find that the error rate from using ML is 3%, so one-fifth of the error rate. And that's because one of the most predictive features was you know, visibility and several of these other contextual uh, things that were going on. So people wanted, you know, yeah, did you have a question? How does training on their behavior with privacy settings violate their privacy? <laughs> I mean, are there, you know, I mean, is there a conflict to that, or should I save that to the end of the talk? I mean, I see what you're getting at. We could save that for the end. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's it's, it. Yes, it's a good meta question. I mean, I mean, how is it different? I, I mean, anyway, I'll save it for the end. Okay. Just interpret the error rate for me. Is that the divergence between what they actually do the first time and? So that's, that's for the ask on first use, the error rate is. So it's deterministic in that the first time they see a prompt for a particular application uh, permission type combination, if they say allow, the, we know that you know, on ask on first use, the system is always going to allow access to you know, that data type for that application. Under our, our, you know, with the experience sampling, we gave them subsequent prompts for that same combination so we can see, yeah, whether they diverged from what the system would have done. Also, just clarifying, so I, I just don't, how do you train a model if there's no prompts to train on? Like the second one? Um, so that was just based on the behavioral data. So whether they, um, we made decisions based on, you know, other u what other users did. So we did leave one out um, validation for that. Oh, I see. So you're, you're still training 
Yes, with sorry, prompts. sorry. Okay. We do use a fully trained model. So we have a fully trained model from the prompts from other users. Then we look at, you know, for the for the training set, we or for the you know, validation set, we look at the people, we throw away all the responses to prompts and just train on what behaviors they've done on the device. Uh, and we found that, you know, we get decent, you know, fit from the model without bothering those users at all. Um, and so, you know, we can optimize for how much we're habituating people to privacy notices. And we find that, you know, this is actually a lot more effective than the ask on first use because it's somewhat accounting for context. Again, I don't think it's possible to fully apply, you know, contextual integrity to this, but we can, you know, have more contextual notices. And so, you know, this brings up the next question. So if we're doing this all with ML to make decisions, we see that there are non-zero error rates. Um, what happens when, you know, errors are made? So, you know, we found that the classifier reduces the error rates, you know, by fivefold, and I think, you know, this is an open question. So is an error rate of 3%, which we found during this one month period, is that the upper bound? You know, probably not, because this was, you know, our first attempt at this. Um, there's probably a lot more we can do to better tune the model, but, you know, it's probably not reasonable to say that we're gonna get, you know, 100% accuracy. Um, if for no other reason, then privacy preferences change over time. And so, you know, users need to be able to do something on the device to understand what decisions were made on their behalf, um, as well as to change those past decisions when they, you know, decide that those decisions were made in error. Um, because if the model's being trained on those decisions for future decisions, you know, they should be able to change settings and then the model should correct itself. And then, you know, in other prior work uh, that we did, uh, this actually involved Jen King, though I think she's out of town. Um, so this was a paper where we looked at how people attribute misbehaviors on devices, and you know what we found is, you know, more often than not, people will go to the settings panel to try and tweak these types of settings. That's intuitive for them. So we figured if we have some sort of interface, we should put that in settings. This prior study also found that you know most people do not understand that applications running in the background often have the same abilities as applications running in the foreground, which is a big problem when you're trying to attribute you know application misbehavior. So that's something that you know a user feedback uh, needs to tackle. And so you know we built this privacy dashboard, um, and we want to see whether this corrects the mental, you know, these incorrect me uh, mental models, and does it actually help users apply context to, uh, you know, these privacy notices. So we created several different tasks. We started with some low fidelity prototypes, and then we add, um, we implemented these as uh, interactive HTML5 widgets so that we can do online studies. Uh, we did, we first did some think alouds, and we had people go through it, and we made, uh, changes based on that. So for the, for the main study, we posted these online. We had this interactive applet that simulated the Android device, and we had people do several different tasks. The tasks were balanced to have uh, some of them be about information retrieval, so answering questions about what decisions you know, the system made on their behalf, as well as changing settings. So you know, go in and change the settings of this app so that it's no longer able to access certain data. Um, so that we didn't want them to be you know, primed about, you know, based on familiarity with existing apps, we made up app names. So, you know, to give an example here, you know, is, uh, is this particular application able to access location when it's not actively being used? So using the, you know, the control system, so the current Android platform, what you would do is you open up the settings panel, you know, click apps. Uh, from here, you have a list of apps, you find the application you're, find, you're trying to get information about. From there, you click permissions, and then it shows the list of permissions that have been you know, requested by that app. Um, you can actually now, in the most recent version of Android, you know, toggle these on a case-by-case -case basis, but it requires going through all of these levels of menus. Um, this is also based on the ask on first use prompts, so this is where you would go to change the decisions from those ask on first use prompts, but it's unlikely anyone actually does. So when you get here, um, you know, how would you answer the question about does this application have background location data? Yeah. I mean, it's ambiguous. Um, so this relies on you there, you, there is actually no distinction in Android. Um, the application either has access to that data type or it doesn't. And so we wanted to see whether users understood this. In our dashboard interface, so here we added a new tile within settings panel based on that previous study, which we called permission manager. And uh, it has this interface, we have uh, a couple columns, so this is recently allowed data types, recently denied, or you can just sort, sort it by you know, app. Um, so here there's a you know, thing for location, you expand, um, it shows the application, and it differentiates between when you know, the data was last uh, accessed, whether it was during you know, the app was being used or when the app was not in use. If you click that, 
there's now this, um, you know, three different options. So for setting, you know, data access. So when you're, you know, always, uh, only when the application is in use, or when, you know, never. And so what we found is when we gave people this interface, there were, you know, very large effects, um, which seem, you know, obvious, right? So in the control condition, less than half the people under, you know, understood that, you know applications have background access, whereas almost everyone understood this when we gave them the new interface. In terms of changing the settings, you know, similar to our prior work, uh, you know, less than, a, thir less than a, you know, a quarter of the participants understood that you know, this was impossible under Android, um, whereas most of the people were able to correctly do this you know, when we gave them the new interface. And so you know, where are we going with this? So we had this you know, mock-up online, we validated you know, the interface. Um, the student who's working on this has actually now implemented this into Android. We have a working prototype. We also have a working prototype of the ML running, you know, in real time on the device. When you make changes to the interface, it retrains the ML. And so the next step is looking at how users are actually using this. Um, I was told we just got IRB approval today for this study. Yay. Um, and what we want to look at is, you know, will they actually use the dashboard to make decisions? Um, the other thing is, um, which you know, I was expecting this question, we've been training based on what people would want. So we give them prompts saying, you know, would you like to allow or deny access to the data? And they don't actually bear out the consequences of incorrectly denying access. This is just asking their preferences, which is still important because we're you know, doing this based on their perceptions. And you know, that suggests that maybe it's incumbent on developers to communicate why data is actually needed. So that you know, if this is actually running, when data is denied to an application and that breaks functionality, you know, there can be consequences. And that's what we're actually primarily testing when we you know, actually have this running and giving it, or giving it to people. So the plan is to recruit 40 local Android users, uh, instrument their phones you know, with our software, use it for a week, uh, measure the types of decisions they make, whether they go back to the dashboard when they do incorrectly deny access to an application, um, and then you know, measure other interactions from within the dashboard. And then you know, once they've discovered you know, how the system works over that week, um, have them come back to the lab to hopefully all return their phones. Um, have uh, several, you know, uh, interview tasks, uh, such as what we had them do, you know, for the online portion of the, the dashboard evaluation. So, you know, future work in this area, um, you know, as I said, the classifier was relatively rudimentary based on, you know, contextual data that, you know, we brainstormed. Um, there's probably other ways of detecting context when people would want to be noti you know, notified about data use. Um, we've been thinking about you know, a few of them, such as you know, whether, whether they're doing something work-related or personal, um, you know, what activities they're engaging in, where they are, where data is going, and so forth. Um, other future work that we'd like to explore is applying recommender systems. So that's another way of reducing you know, user burden. If people like you have made you know, similar privacy decisions, I mean, that's essentially what the ML is doing. But you know, Maybe we can, you know, further leverage recommender systems to, you know, bootstrap how, you know, the settings initially appear on the device or have a change over time. Um, and so then, you know, other future work um, that, you know, I've actively uh, been thinking about and we've started uh, working on is now you have you know sort of this agent in your pocket that you carry everywhere that has inferred your preferences, uh, which I think uh, what you were getting at is that could have cre you know create risks. Was that what you were getting at? Oh, yeah. well, why don't we? Oh, I'll say that to the end. Uh, so you know you have this device that has you know learned your privacy preferences and your behaviors over time. Um, Maybe that could be used for propagating those privacy preferences to other devices in your environment. So maybe in IoT you know, environments, uh, being able to signal to other devices uh, your data capture preferences, for instance, or even you know, obscuring certain types of data that's emanating from your device and being shared with other devices. And then the last point that I was going to talk about is you know, why, why should we care about any of this? Well, what I started talking about was you know, regulatory frameworks. So in the US, at least, um, there aren't very strict guidelines, at, you know, at least you know, vis-a-vis -vis, you know, EU privacy regulations. But there are a few very narrow sectors. So one is uh, privacy involving children. So there's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which governs uh, data collection for children 13 and under. And there are very rigid guidelines about what apps and websites can and cannot do. So here, you know, a couple examples. So you know, listing all data recipients in privacy notices, um, allowing parents to limit the data collection, not using behavioral targeting, 
um, and so forth. And so using our instrumented version of Android, which we can use to, you know, know immediately when data is first requested you know, by the app on the device, um, how frequently, um, and then augmenting that with network analysis tools. So uh, Lumen uh, slash Haystack is a network monitoring tool that was also developed at ICSI. Um, it runs on the device as a VPN interface so it can intercept SSL traffic as well. We can see exactly where sensitive data goes. So we can see you know, from beginning you know, to exfiltration what's happening to data on the device. And so what we're working on right now is trying to do some you know, automatic behavior detection on apps. So the idea is to run a test bed to do automated app analysis um, to see which, you know, which parties it's going to. Um, is location data collected, which is uh, one of the things that COPPA uh, has requirements about. Uh, persistent identifiers, COPPA also governs that. Governs that. Um, and whether this is shared across uh, different apps, different third parties, and so forth. The problem with you know, examining app data flows is all of the tools that we've written are for dynamic analysis. So you know, our tools log data once code is executed. It's not like we're just analyzing, you know, doing static analysis to like, look through code to see what could it do. We're looking at what it actually does. And that means someone actually executing applications. Um, and so you know, when they ex execute the applications, we're also trying to you know, optimize for coverage. We want to explore as many branches of the code as possible to see if we can trigger all the possible events um, that correspond to things that might be happening to sensitive data. So there are two ways of doing this, um, two approaches that we've come up with. So one is you know, hiring cheap labor. So we've hired some undergrads um, to pay uh, and paid them to uh, play with children's apps uh, using instrumented devices and then you know, capturing data that way. Uh, the other way uh, is using the exerciser monkey, uh, which is a technique that uh, Erwin, who's in my group at ICSI, has uh, developed. So the exerciser monkey is a utility uh, for developers, basically it, you know, bangs on the application UI using you know, random generated input uh, to try and see. It's intended for developers to see you know, if, it, if it'll break the app, um, but we're using it to you know, randomly see if we, you know, how much coverage we can get on the code. Certainly, this works really well for you know, apps targeted at toddlers where it's just you know, shiny pictures and you click various things. Uh, what we found is you know, looking at a corpus of, uh, f first we looked at 500 apps. We found that you know, for 60% of them, we get similar core, uh, code coverage between the exerciser mon monkey running for 10 minutes and paying an undergrad to play the apps for 10 minutes. Um, but obviously, as the apps get more and more complex, uh, there are probably shortcomings of the monkey. <coughs> so here's an example finding. So here's a, a children's app. Um, Animal Paradise, and we found this you know, in the Google Play Store. This is clearly uh, subject to COPPA because the developer has self-declared you know, that the, there are categories. When the developer uploads an application, they specify the category uh, that the app should appear under. And this, was, you know, this appeared under apps for children five and under. Therefore, the developer has acknowledged that you know, they're subject to COPPA. So we ran the app through the monkey, and here's what we found. So in the yellow up here, um, we can see that this is being transmitted to port 80, um, which is a COPPA violation. All traffic uh, going to you know, various parties uh, needs to be encrypted. And it's going to a third party called Talking Data, which is a analytics provider in China. Uh, the blue, <coughs> or turquoise, uh, is uh, these are a list of personal identifier or of unique device identifiers. So uh, one of these is the IMEI. There's a device serial number. There's the Google account uh, ID, uh, which are also prohibited by COPPA. And in the green, uh, it has the ICSI SS ID that we're currently connected to, the MAC address of that wireless network. Um, and various network configuration data. So it shows the SSIDs of previous networks uh, that we've connected to. So this is actually behavior that the FTC just settled uh, with InMobi over. InMobi is an analytics provider. Um, there was a multi-million dollar settlement for them you know, taking SSIDs off of devices and using this to track location. And actually, this is you know, pretty granular. So just looking up the MAC address of the SSID that we're connected to, we did this. And you know, here we are at, at ICSI. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so um, we decided in the interest of you know, uh, fair disclosure, we notified the developer. And we were actually really surprised because three days later, uh, they emailed us back to say, thank you. Uh, we've removed talking data from all of our apps. 
And we went to the Google Play Store, and sure enough, I think we notified them, it was like January 7th or so. Um, three days later, all of their apps um, from the same developer had been updated. We checked the binaries. Um, this particular analytics provider was removed. So where we're going with this, um, one thing that's in the works, uh, we're still testing it, is attribution. So when doing this dynamic analysis, we have our instrumentation that can track you know, all the API calls. Uh, we're now separating out whether access to sensitive data came from core application code versus the third party you know, analytics and advertising, advertising providers, which is useful information to have. Um, another thing we're doing is virtualization. So being able to spin up you know, instances of our instrumented version of Android in a VM, if we use just the monkey, you know, we can massively parallelize this, throw lots of Android APKs at it, and test you know, thousands or you know, potentially millions of uh, Android apps um, so that we can do this at scale. And so the idea is to put this all together into a pipeline. Um, we're collecting Android APKs right now. We're trying to get around a million. Um, I mentioned the simulated user interactions using the monkey. One of the future projects in the next year or two is to try and uh, instrument the monkey so that we can figure out where the stopping points are and then feed those to crowd workers. So the idea is uh, people on, say, Mechanical Turk, we can pay them a couple cents to basically do the jobs of the undergrads that I previously hired. Go to this website, play around with the children's app, which is you know, basically using HTML5 um, for, you know, to play the, the, you know, the UI for the app, which is running in our VM. We get all the instrumentation that goes to the database, and then we put it on a website. Maybe even offer an API for you know, other people to access our results. Um, I've hired two MIMS students to actually do the web design. We have. Um, some drafts of this. Here's just one iteration of the design for the website. You know, you search for an application. It'll show you, you know, the different types of sensitive data that we've observed. Uh, down below, we have a list of third parties uh, that we've observed data going to, and what those, you know, third parties have collected, and so forth. But this is very much a work in progress. So, you know, takeaway from all of this is that, you know, there are ways for notice and choice to be made more usable. Um, we can do this by showing them, you know, contextually, um, at contextually appropriate times, so that we're not bothering users with expected access to data, which is going to habituate them to future prompts. Um, and then we should also show these infrequently. So when they are asked to make decisions, we should have systems learn from those decisions to, you know, to further show them fewer decisions in the future. Uh, but then, you know, again, feedback loops are needed because we're not going to do this you know, always correctly. And I will leave it at that. So we have a little time for questions. Uh, the talk is being recorded and webcast, so please use the mic when you ask a question. And why don't we start with Marty, since we put off her question till the end. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the great talk. And uh, the question I wanted to ask was, so I, I like the idea of figuring out what people's preferences are without having to make them articulate them, since they probably don't know what they are. Uh, uh, so actually, I have two different questions. So the first is, but you know, the idea was to monitor their behavior in order to figure out yeah. what they wanted. And so it's a clever idea to monitor how they diddle with privacy preferences to infer maybe what their privacy preferences are. It's a cool idea. But the question is just, you know, uh, are you telling them that you're monitoring their privacy preferences? And does this actually just cause a problem on top of a problem by monitoring their privacy preferences? I mean, that, did that figure in to it at all? Um. Those are very good questions. I have two conflicting answers. <laughs> um, in terms of you know the basic one, you know, in terms of consent, I mean, you know, in the in the course of the research, we you know when they come in and we instrument the phones, you know, there's a consent form and we give them a briefing up front. We don't emphasize that this is all about privacy, um, but we say these are the types of you know we're working on improving you know user experience on these devices. These are the types of things we're monitoring. We're not saving PII. Um, when they participate in these studies. So, you know, from a you know, research ethics standpoint, uh, I think we're well covered there. In terms of, you know, the practical concerns, you know, here's where I have two different answers. So, you know, one is, yeah, I think it is a very real concern that, you know, yeah, we're doing a lot of kind of invasive monitoring on the devices. 
Um, you know, one response to that is that's already happening in a lot of other domains. So you know, when you use the web, um, that's happening all over the place. So you know, behavioral advertising, you know, Facebook, you know, is profiling people based on the interests, what they like, the websites that they visit. That's already happening for marketing purposes. Why don't we do that for direct user benefit for security and privacy purposes? But the other half of that is, you know, if we are doing this, then we yeah, we need to absolutely be sure that we're doing it in a you know very privacy protective way. So in terms of doing like you know the ML we're doing a lot of the training on the device we're not uploading you know PII off the device the idea is you know to try and you know do this in as much a privacy preserving way as possible because we don't want this to be another possible you know attack vector so if this device has all sorts of information about your preferences and behaviors that's obviously juicy information especially if someone wants to maybe car you know carve out a you know very targeted attack that's you know going to be you know targeted at you based on your previous behaviors um, so those are different, definitely things we're thinking about. I guess, uh, if I can follow up, is that all right? I guess I wasn't even thinking about it from the attack point of view as from the whole purpose of people being concerned about their privacy. Part of it is to protect against attacks, but part of it is to people being sick of being monitored. And so the whole point is maybe some people want to set their preferences to have agency. And so by having this thing in the background happening without being told just for your own good, just there, there, we'll do it for your own good, we'll just monitor what you're doing and figure out for you what you want. Um, I mean, that's kind of the point I was making. Sure, and I think that kind of illustrates the whole point of the talk, which is the current way that we give them agency is through notice, and we know that empirically that's not working. Um, so, you know, yeah, we either, you know, give them full disclosure and the opportunity to see exactly what's happening, which most people aren't going to do, despite articulating, you know, clear privacy preferences that might contradict what's actually happening. Um, or we give them the opportunity to, you know, state some preferences and, show, you know, and try and make some decisions about the things that they might want to know about. Right. Um, uh, my other question was just, um, so then I'll give up the mic. Uh, so my frustration with these things is, uh, my inclination is just say no, uh, you can't have permissions and then none of this stuff follows, but then usually the apps don't work. So uh, have you explored the, the, um, the option of you know, more prompting the providers to give more of an explanation I think this is heading in that direction. Why, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, so to use a, you know, a, an economics term, basically you know, it's the you know, market for lemons we, we have right now. So there's you know, information asymmetry, only the providers, the app, you know, vendors know what data is being collected. And the problem with that is it's sort of a race to the bottom. So people are concerned about privacy and certainly articulate those concerns. And so right now, you know, a lot of people are you know, sort of just going on the assumption that everything is being collected um, for right or wrong, which you know, that's not uh, an accurate view of the world. And so my goal is to try and you know, close that information asymmetry. So if you know, providing these notices contextually prompts the developers to better articulate why data is needed, that's a great success. Hey, so this actually follows closely along with the first part of Marty's question. And, and I thought this was where you were headed. And you addressed it a little bit in your talk. But I also sort of like the idea of reducing sort of the, the fatigue by training a model that's designed for a person, a specific person. But you know, when you declare a sort of lower error rates, right, there's implicitly an objective function, which is to match the person's perceived preferences, right? But yeah. you know, I think you said this several times also, that like we know that people's desired privacy behaviors are not necessarily optimal. Um, either from a societal perspective or from their own. They, people just don't really understand privacy well enough. And so I guess I'm curious to think about how you would operationalize sort of these customized like minimization functions in a scenario where like, you know, the thing that you can measure easily is not really the desire you want to optimize. Well. Sorry, the behavior you want to optimize. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And I mean, that sort of gets at the main uh, motivation for doing this field study where we actually put the classifier on the device with the feedback mechanisms. Because then we can see when, you know, when things are, you know, denied, 
you know, they deny something and then decide that, oh, they actually wanted, you know, to use a particular feature, whether they revisit those decisions and then, you know, over time what the steady state actually ends up looking at, you know, looking like. Because right now, because of these information asymmetries, you know, they don't know when the data is being used and so just asking them abstractly with no consequences, yeah, we're looking at just their, you know, preferences, their preferences based on no knowledge of why the data is needed. Maybe we get to, you know, the, you know, this place that, you know, Marty was alluding to where that prompts the developers to provide more notice um, why data is needed. And if that's the case and that, cha you know, that changes their preferences, that's great. I mean, they've made an informed decision then. Um, and so I think that's why it's really important right now to look at, you know, what's happening in practice when we, you know, when we give this to them, what happens, what breaks in applications and what they think, you know, those applications need the data for. Yeah, no, I, I, that makes a lot of sense, and that sort of gets at one side of it, but it's, it's sort of a two-sided thing and where, like, the costs of misclassifications are maybe asymmetric, right? Like, so that might get them to sort of opt into more warnings that they should be paying attention to or to, like, provide more information that, um, that makes the app more functional. But, like, the, it, you know, I think the real worry is that they then sort of, if it allows the app to do something that really is nefarious or, like, is more than just, like, a privacy infringement that... Um, well, but that goes to... I mean, the first part is, which is, you know, there is governing, you know, law about this such that if notice is given, so if this prompts developers to provide more notice about why data is needed and they're lying and using data, you know, for different purposes, then that's actionable. I mean, so that, that's, that, you know, that becomes a policy problem at that point. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a thanks. simple question, but maybe you have a not simple answer. Um, I was wondering just what the, your sampling strategy was when you were doing these user studies, like what kinds of populations you drew from. I would think that privacy, and especially privacy by context, is going to vary along a lot of different dimensions with different yep. groups of people. And I'm curious. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so for you know the field study, well, OK, so for the, the first field study that we did where we gave people phones for a week to use, those were people we got off of Craigslist. Um, which is a problem because you know we know that we're you know somewhat the sample is somewhat deficient in terms of you know working professionals who might actually have more sensitive data to protect on their devices. Um, that's why uh, for a related well related to this project, uh, we've also been looking at extreme users as well, um, which I did not talk about in, in this talk. Um, uh, a lot of you probably know Nathan Good, um, so he's been working with me on a bunch of these things. Actually, Nathan is not here because he and my postdoc are driving to LA uh, to do uh, interviews with law enforcement people there about you know BYOD devices and the types of threats you know and sen you know and privacy sensitive you know sensitivities that that they have, um, so that we can try and account for for some of those you know different concerns from people at the other end of the spectrum. Um, as a matter of convenience, the you know the 130 person sample that we had over the course of a month, uh, we used Phone Lab. I don't know if everyone's familiar with this. This was a project. Uh, it was an NSF funded project out of the University of Buffalo, where they were creating. Um, you know, general purpose re research infrastructure for others doing, you know, mobile work to use. Um, so they had funding for about 200 or 300 people. They gave them phones and at the beginning were paying for their phone plans, but it was a, a version of Android that allowed them to push, uh, you know, new Android ROMs over the air, um, allowing researchers like us to put instrumentation at the OS level. And so those were all people who were recruited um, uh, out of the University of Buffalo. It wasn't mostly students, but you know, there were a lot of you know, people that the university, that, that research group had recruited who we had you know, no contact with. We were just able to push you know, ROS image uh, to them to use for a month. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly gaps, but you know, uh, as I like to tell people, you know, the, all samples are you know, fundamentally biased towards you know, people who are willing to participate in research when you're doing you know, research with you know, informed consent. So um, it would be nice to get you know, some of these other niche groups like you know, working professionals who have really sensitive data. We're trying to get some at the extreme end, as I mentioned, but it's hard to say you know, where our gaps are. Uh, any more questions? Two polls in a row. Thank you. Um, you. You mentioned in passing, just as, as it were, well, things look very different in Europe, uh, and, and this was just. Uh, do you have a sense? I mean, often the American view is of come some kind of big brother, 
But do you have any sense of how your research would look done in Europe? That is, is the Big Brother effect in some sense guaranteeing that people are making the right decisions more or that the effects are less invasive? I honestly don't know. I don't really want to speculate on that. I mean, the, there's a lot of privacy literature that's compared, you know, privacy perceptions and concerns in Europe versus the U.S. And, you know, the one, you know, very basic finding is, you know, people in the U.S. are concerned about what government does with their data. Um, and by and large, you know, trust companies to keep their data from the government. I mean, if you look at, you know, uh, you know, the stories about, you know, the government trying to get data from Facebook and Google, um, you know, the, the, the companies in this case are very much fighting the good fight, preventing government from accessing data, which is the complete opposite in, you know, the European perspective is people relying on the government to protect them from companies accessing data. Um, I mean, that's, you know, the main high level difference, uh, I think. Uh, there are also a lot more stringent regulations with regard to notice in Europe. So, you know, one thing is, uh, well, there's soon going to be the, um, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which, you know, governs a lot of this. Um, I don't know how that's going to be uh, implemented in terms of apps. I bet uh, Deirdre knows. Um, and, you know, and they have the, the, you know, the cookie thing. So when you access websites from a, and I think this is a huge blunder, you know, if we look at the habituation literature, when you access a website in Europe, you get a little bar at the top saying this site uses cookies. It's like telling people that their smartphone app, you know, requests internet access. Um, you see this on every website, so it's not clear how much good that's doing. Um, I don't know what this, you know, what, whether people would make different decision, decisions on this system versus that. Um, I think that's something interesting to study. This is really interesting, Serge. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I, I have two, maybe two questions, but they're kind of very closely related to each other. And and the first one is, what would, you know, should we be training this machine learning algorithm on what? one of these users in your study does? Or should we be training it on what, how Serge Eggleman uh, <laughs> selects the, you know, the, the options on, on his phone? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand even you know, <coughs> how I would go about a process of deciding what to do. And I think I'm terrible at deciding what to do, like what apps sure. to give permission to. And I, I think th this crowd sort of uh, recognizes very clearly that you know, things like lo your location at different times can be very sensitive in surprising ways, but that seems like something that's not even well known. Uh, so I, I, I wonder, you know, what does empowering users in itself sort of do if a lot of this is sort of requires sort of expert knowledge? Um, and and is, is there some role for, for maybe, I don't know if it's the, the provider of the operating system? And I guess the other, the other half of this is sort of how much of it boils down to market power in, in, in that, yeah. you know, I, I to and this actual, day, Well, that's where choice comes in, right? So, yeah, if the, market, if the market is architected in such a way that there's no, you know, real choice, then what right, can people right. do? So, so, so yeah. Maybe I, I want to, you know, hire cars to take me around, and it's very convenient, and I still think that is, maybe it's creepy yeah. what they do with my data, but I, I really don't want to just remove myself from that market. Uh, maybe if I could band together with, you know, a few million other users that feel the same way, then we could do something. But as it stands, I don't think that, you know, just my decision to not. Of, ...of society, it just seems to make my life very inconvenient. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, the basic answer which you know, transcends this research and I guess is kind of a common theme with all of the privacy stuff that I'm doing is the main difference between privacy and security is with, when you're looking at security, there's often ground truth, right? We know if you do this, you're going to get infected and bad things are going to happen. Don't do this. And then it's just you know, designing systems to get people to not do this. With privacy, um, you know, there's a wealth of literature showing that people have very different privacy preferences. And my goal there is really just, you know, give, you know, help people make informed decisions. What they ultimately decide, as long as it's an informed decision, that's totally up to them. We know that everyone has their own utility function, so maybe you value price more than privacy and are willing to, you know, save money by giving up, you know, data to analytics providers. Great, good for you. That's your personal choice to make. Um, in terms of you know, 
And that, well, that, that, that's why I don't think this should be prescriptive about what apps you should use and what you should you know, say in response to you know, various notices and what choices you should make. That said, what the role for experts, I think, is, and, you know, and what I would do is helping people to make more informed choices. So you know, the average user might think, well, what do I care if, you know, if this you know, analytics provider takes the MAC address of the Wi-Fi network that I'm connected to? Very, you know, very likely don't realize that that, in, you know, that that can be used to infer their location and over time you know, track them from place to place. That's where you know, expert knowledge comes in, is being able to map you know, individual you know, data collection events to long-term you know, privacy concerns. And you know, once people are aware of the different concerns, they can make their own choices. Um, so I think I'll reserve the last question for myself. Um, uh, you mentioned in future work that you want to look at privacy, these, the sort of extension of this, looking at the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. And um, given the great plethora of types of displays and interactions, from you know the, the Fitbit with a couple LEDs to a Nest thermostat to uh, whatever, whatever uh, uh, Samsung's uh, TVs do, uh, what, um, what is a, a common unifying theme for for that? How can you how can you hope to abstract out over so many different types of devices yeah. um, based on your work so far in, in future experiments? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So, I mean, the starting point um, from which I'm you know approaching the IoT space is just looking at device capabilities. Um, we've done a couple lar very large scale surveys to try and understand how people's privacy preferences shift from one you know, data capture scenario to another so that we can try and generalize. So for instance, um, one of the things that we found is uh, you know, there's a big difference between in-home data capture and public data capture. So most people by and large either, you know, expect, uh, either, either expect or are somewhat okay with you know, uh, capture of publicly observable events. Uh, whereas people don't expect data capture within the home um, regarding, say, audio and video. Um, also, you know, people are concerned with things that might have financial costs, which makes sense. Um, so, you know, if you abstract some of the possible consequences, you can then, you know, map that to device capabilities to try and reason about the, you know, appropriate versus inappropriate, you know, data flows that people would want to be made aware of. And um, there's actually an IETF standard um, that's in the works. Um, uh, to try and create a standardized uh, machine readable uh, listing of device capabilities um, for you know in the IOT space so you can query devices to see what you know it's cap stated cap sensor capabilities are and then you know what I'm hoping to do is try and you know map that to some of this uh, work we've been doing to capture preferences in this space um, so then we can you know automatically reason about what to do given a you know future device well, uh, I think uh, I speak for everyone. Thanks for a really excellent talk. And, Thank you. Uh, uh, Serge uh, is, lives in Berkeley, so if, I'm anyone, here all has, week. if anyone has any further uh, questions, you can certainly uh, reach out to him.